Good, good afternoon, I guess, technically, everybody. Uh, my name is Kyle Plenty. I am the Vice President and Principal with RKG Associates. We are economic, real estate, and planning consulting firms, a uh, firm out of uh, Alexandria, Virginia. That's where I'm located. Um, if you're not familiar with, where, with this process, we've been retained by <coughs> the economic, the Dale Boyle County Economic Development Partnership to prepare a strategic economic development plan for the, the county. Um, tonight is the first of a number of sessions that we're going to have with the elected officials. Uh, through this process, and uh, if I'm wrong, Ben, let me know, we're going to do five of these, uh, where we're going to be unveiling the research and the findings that we have in a, in a very thoughtful process to make sure that everybody, when we get to the end of this, everybody's on the same page in terms of understanding why the recommendations are coming out the way that they are. We felt that it was a very important component of this analysis to make sure that the decision makers within the community are just as versed in the findings and the, the ramifications of those findings in economic development as the Economic Development Partnership Working Group. And so here we are tonight. On behalf of myself and Lauren Callahan uh, from my office, who's going to be doing the presentation for us, I want to thank you all for attending. I want to make sure that all of our elected officials are sitting up here at the table. Is, is that the case? And I apologize. I probably should know that, but I don't. And so uh, given, the, given the levity of how this meeting started, I think we're all okay with that. And so <clears throat> with that, I want to kind of jump into this. Tonight's presentation is going to be focused on the demographic, economic, and real estate market findings that we've found to date. Uh, I will tell you that they are not necessarily 100% exhaustive. There's a lot of work that has gone into this. We pulled out the pieces of information we felt are most salient to economic development. Now, there are other factors in here that we recognize are very important to the community, but as I mentioned, our job is to help you create an economic development strategy, and so everything we show you here tonight was delivered upon how this has some sort of impact on economic development. I do want to start, this is an interactive process. Uh, if, you, if you saw my, uh, was it October or September show, uh, my expectation of everybody sitting here in the horseshoe is to interact with us. If you have questions, ask it. If you have thoughts, please share them. Uh, you're not going to throw us off um, in interrupting in the, in the presentation. Just understand the more you ask, the longer we stay here. Uh, but with that is I wanted to get you guys talking because in the, in the last time we were here and the limited time we've been here in this go-round, it has become apparent to us that there may not be exactly a, a universally accepted definition of what economic development is and what that means for Boyle County. And so I'm going to start by asking all of you to share with us what does economic development mean to you? And it, I think it's a valuable exercise, not only from us to hear your thoughts on this, but also for each other to hear what you're thinking. Because frankly, at the end of this, we all have to agree upon the definition of economic development as it relates to Boyle County and then be willing to act upon it based on the recommendations that come out at the end. So with that, I'm looking for my first brave volunteer to share with everyone what economic development means to you. I think it's um, job growth and retention come to mind immediately, I guess. So job growth and retention? Mm -hmm. Excellent, thank you. Quality and health, excuse me, quality and health of the community. And can, city and, and can you tell me what the health of the community means to you? Nobody's got a cold. <laughs> <laughs> well, then I'm already, I am already failing you as a community, so I apologize about that. <clears throat> I think it, it's a community that, that, that people can make a living, raise a family. Uh, I've always thought it would be wonderful if you, if, you, if you started your family and your son or daughter grew up here was able to come back here after their formal education, find a job here, and raise their family. Excellent. And, and that's that's health of a community to me, to be able to do all of it. And the investment you made in their education, uh, you get a return from their payroll tax. So there you go. You get a return. Excellent, thank you. Anyone else? Nobody has an, another opinion on economic development? Of this Increased payroll tax. There we go. <laughs> And that's the occupational license tax for those of you who are uh, uh, tracking at home for the official date of it. But thank you. I guess it's the, the recruitment efforts that bring to develop a new business or company to our, yeah, to our community. So recruitment. Yes. Okay, excellent. Anything else? Retain what we have. There you go, retention. 
And would you would you agree to the expansion of those businesses that we have as well, as part of it? I think one one thing that comes to my mind is uh, uh, people interested in coming to this city and the county is is making it job friendly, uh, being open up where you feel they feel like they're welcome and, and don't make it so hard for them to open up. So, so in that regard, economic development is being a business-friendly community. Right. That's part of economic development. Excellent. Other thoughts? Anyone who has a chair? Someone who wants to chair twice? In addition to everything here, they've all said, I think that uh, bringing people to your community, even if they don't stay, they come and spend money. So whether it's uh, putting people in hotels or they came to use our trails or our parks and use their and benefit from our restaurants and stuff, that, that's adding to the so, so creating a, a destination, whether it be uh, consumption or entertainment or recreation, is creating a destination within the community of economic development. Excellent. I would say the economic development is also compatible to economic development with what's existing and desired. We may not want certain type of industries or jobs that might not be compatible with the quality that we have. Absolutely, and, and, and I think that's a great way of, the way I would define that is, quality of life is that we don't want to affect the health of our community as you mentioned with bringing in just any business as economic development absolutely other thoughts anyone who has to share want to share I'm happy to well I first want to appreciate you responding back to me because I know sometimes uh, you know these can be a little bit overwhelming and, and um, we're going to be throwing a bunch of information at you tonight so like I said if you have any additional questions for us as we go through this, please don't hesitate to interrupt us. I just want to really quickly, and, and you don't need to read that, but really to, to, from RKG Associates, what we define economic development, it's a series of actions or investments made by the community, whether it's a single governmental entity or multiple governmental entity, and frankly also the private sector, at leveraging your public assets to promote private investment, because we want to improve the fiscal, financial, and economic health of our community. And the reason why I put this up here, and if you caught my last show, you saw this already, is the fact that economic development is action. It's, it's not a thought, it's not a, it's not a goal, it's implementation. And so at the end of this, and we're not gonna get this, not at the end of this tonight, but at the end of this, what we're gonna deliver to you is a series of action steps that takes what you've defined as economic development and translate that into things that we can do as a community, support, promote, and, and invest in that will help you get to those goals. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Laura Callahan and she is gonna walk you through the process. I'm not gonna to be too far away. And so we're going to walk you through, like I said, the demographic, economic phase, and the, the real estate market analysis. And not just give you the data, but really try and drive down what it means from an economic development perspective. So with that, Lauren, please take it away. All right, good evening, hello everybody. Oh, sorry if I missed the introductions. Um, all right, so let's move right into demographics. So when we looked at the demographics for, and in a lot of ways the economic base piece for Boyle County, we looked at several other larger regional and potentially competing markets to get an idea of where we sit within the larger region and for instance, in this case, the Bluegrass ADD. So we looked not only at Boyle County, but we also looked at a surrounding market, which we defined as Washington, Mercer, Girard, Lincoln, Casey, and Marion. And then we also looked at the Bluegrass ADD, which includes some of those counties, as well as Boyle County. So when we start to look at the demographics of all of these areas, we see that in the last few several years, since 2000, there's been a, a steady population growth in Boyle County, which was a little bit greater between 2010 and 2016. But it, by comparison, recent growth has been at a lower level in the surrounding market, though at a much higher level in the Bluegrass ADD, which has Fayette and Lexington, and that metro, larger metropolitan area. When we look at projections moving forward through 2040, we see a slightly different picture. We see the impact of continued growth, projected continued growth in Boyle County, but then projected declines in these surrounding counties compared to a larger growth 
in that met Lexington metropolitan area and the bluegrass ABD. Now this ultimately has the potential to really impact the economy of Boyle County because, because Boyle County is an importer of jobs, which we'll discuss a little bit later on in the presentation. And so the fact that the population in the counties surrounding Boyle is declining, there will be an impact on the labor force. But in addition to looking at population change over time, it's important to look at the makeup of that population, particularly age group. So here you can see the current population breakdown of Boyle County is primarily persons between the age of 35 and 54 and 55 and over. But over the last 16 years, since 2000, and, since 2000, there's been a growth in the population of persons between 55 years of age and older, and a decline in that working, the primary working age population between 25 and 34. And this too, ultimately, will have an impact on Boyle County's labor force. In addition to looking at population, we also looked a little bit at household income to get a better sense of where Boyle County sits with the surrounding communities. And in general, Boyle County actually has a higher median household income than the surrounding market, but a lower median household income than the Bluegrass ADD with the larger metropolitan Lexington area. And you can see how this breaks down within Boyle County a little bit further when you can notice here that the distribution of incomes is primarily in the moderate and lower income households. And there are fewer pop, uh, households that earn $75,000 or more. And from an economic development perspective, this is valuable from an employer's point of view in terms of the cost of labor. And this could be a competitive advantage that we have that is something that could be sold is that you know, if I go to a more metropolitan or urban area or a more expensive part of the country, my cost for labor is going to be much higher. And this also illustrates that there's a diversity in the existing workforce in terms of wages that the, that, that workforce is receiving and the skills and positions that they are holding. So when we look at this in the terms of economic development overall, we see that Boyle County is performing much better than the surrounding county, particularly in its population projections, as well as in its median household income, which also speaks to the jobs that are located in Boyle County. The population change in age, though, has and is projected to continue to impact the workforce in Boyle County as the working age population declines and we see a growing population of empty nesters and retirees and people who ultimately are not working at all or <clears throat> are semi-retired. And, and I will say that from that perspective, the size and scale of the types of businesses that we're going to be most successful in bringing here to the community will be influenced by that. Because the reality is as our labor force is, is not <coughs> growing very strong, and frankly, we are a relatively small labor market area that can, Boyle County and the immediate, immediate surrounding counties, we have to be mindful of that when someone makes a flippant comment saying, when, when have we gotten the last 500 job company to come here to Boyle County? And my response would be, I think that's gonna be a tall order because how are you going to promise those folks that there's gonna be laborers to take those jobs? And we'll talk a little bit more about the size of labor force in just a moment, but it's an important distinction to make when you're looking at this demographic information. <coughs> And as we just briefly mentioned, the distribution of household income really does reflect a diverse workforce, which speaks to potential businesses and existing businesses on the range of skill level of the, the existing workforce, but also will impact recruitment strategies moving forward. So moving on to a little bit more at the economy and at the labor force that we just discussed, Boyle County's labor force is substantially smaller, almost 12,000, compared to the surrounding region and compared to the Bluegrass ADD. And this means that in order to attract those larger companies, 
the draw on the existing labor force and the surrounding communities will need to be greater. And so therefore the decline in the population of the surrounding market could potentially have a greater impact if targeting those larger companies. But over time, so over time, where this really all comes together is that Boyle County has seen a decline in its labor force participation. This has been impacted by several different factors, including the economic recession that we all know has impacted the economy both locally and nationally, as well as the fact that we are seeing that growth in the population of, of retirees and seniors in the area which are people who are not necessarily going to join the labor force. And when, that, when we compare that to the surrounding market, which, are the, which is the lower portion of this graphic, we can see that the surrounding market has actually also stagnated in its labor force development and hasn't really changed much since the recession. But when we look at unemployment rates, we also see the impact of a recession with the increase in all areas across the region, but then a notable decline in unemployment to, in most cases, pre-recession levels, which does indicate that the, economies in, the economy in Boyle County and in the surrounding region is recovering from the, has recovered from the recession. So, we have a labor force that overall has declined, but that's not the only part of the story. The characteristics of that labor force are, already, are also important in order to get a better sense of how to recruit and market Boyle County to potential businesses. The population, the, I'm sorry, the education attainment in Boyle County is actually overall higher than that of our surrounding market, though a little bit lower than that of the Bluegrass APD. Now in general, this means that Boyle County will be a little bit more competitive in, in attracting higher skill businesses who require higher skill employees, but there's also a diversity in the education attainment within Boyle County that can be attractive to a wide range of businesses that are looking for a variety of skill levels and, and levels of education. And as a little bit of a comparison, when we look at the Bluegrass uh, Labor for, work, sorry, Workforce Development Area, which is very similar to the Bluegrass ADD, a large portion of the workforce, including Boyle County, are white collar uh, occupations, though there are a notable number of blue collar occupations as well. And to the extent that we can assume that this larger area represents Boyle County, it does indicate that the local labor force, though primarily white collar, does have a concentration of blue collar occupations as well. And before you move on, Lauren, I, I do want to say that when you look at this, I was a little bit surprised by how heavily dependent the region is on white collar labor. And that is an important finding from the perspective of recruitment. Once again, it goes back to scale. I know we talk a lot about industrial recruitment here in Boyle County, and that's something that's very, very important. But when we look at it, you know, the total percentage of blue collar labor, particularly at the high skilled level, there's just not a lot of people that are doing that job. And so there has to be a compelling reason why, not just for Boyle County, but to come to this region. And so how do we then develop those niches? How do we then ensure that what we're trying to attract is compatible with our labor force. And we're going to talk about this as well, but at a future session, but this goes back to the importance of our workforce development and how do we tie what we're trying to retain and grow and what we're trying to bring in the community with the types of education, you know, middle school, secondary, post-secondary education, and not necessarily for two or four year degree post-secondary education to our residents and to our neighbors, frankly, so that we can then ensure that we're successful bringing in the types of businesses that we want. What, what, what would a low skill white collar job be? Retail. Oh. So it, it, this is, we kind of define, this is an internally defined through our experience of looking at various occupations and the types of education or specialized training that they require. The lower skill tend to require very little or, or, or a non-certificate based level of training to do the job where someone uh, effectively can, can show up with a GED or maybe even less and do the job uh, effectively with very little on the job training. So then the next step up would be what? 
what what would that be? Some le some level of a of, of a either GED equivalent or post secondary one or two year certificate training program where you're not going to be able to just step into and do it as a 17 year old, for example. From the blue collar side, semi skilled a lot of time requires specialized one or two year training programs. On the white collar side is maybe an associate's degree or a certain level of post secondary education. And then you get into some formalized education that requires either a sec two or four year degree or a very substantial training program to, to become certified. Thank you. So in terms of employment trends, what we're actually what we've seen is that since 2006 there has been a steady loss of employment. Um, particularly, I'm sorry, since the recession, there has been a loss of employment um, in Boyle County, but for a variety of reasons. There's a lot that's impacted that. One is the fact that there's been a global shift in how businesses are choosing to hire, um, specific, particularly after the downturn, as well as the fact that we have seen that loss of working age population in the labor force. And there is the impact, particularly in areas such as manufacturing, that technology has really had on human capital needs um, nationally and globally. But healthcare, manufacturing, and retail trade continue to be the largest employment sectors in Boyle County. And healthcare over this period of time, unlike the total population, actually has, had, has experienced consistent growth. And even as employment has declined in the county, non-employer establishments have actually seen a small growth since the recession, as possibly some individuals have changed from full-time position to a contract position with their company, and due to the entrepreneurial spirit in the area that has encouraged people to start their own business as a single, essentially a single employer or a sole proprietor. And this is actually one area where you could potentially look at adding additional um, business development efforts to really encourage and develop that in the future. In terms of the surrounding market, the employment levels have actually stabilized since the recession. Healthcare and retail and manufacturing continue to be the large sectors in the surrounding counties as well. And Healthcare and retail trade have seen similar trends, but in manufacturing, there's actually been an increase in employment exclusively due to Marion County, which continues to offer spec buildings that are available to businesses to move in, and that has really helped to maintain and grow their manufacturing employment base even since the recession. So if we look at where jobs are located in Boyle County, we can really see that the greatest concentration are in the areas where we have the largest employers. They're around Danville, the where RR Donnelly are, is located, they're downtown by Ephraim McDowell and all of the downtown businesses, as well as by American Greetings and Central <coughs> College. And as discussed earlier, the impact of the surrounding market does have an effect on the labor force in Boyle County, and you can see that here. Boyle County is an importer of jobs. Of labor. Oh, I'm sorry, of labor, I apologize. An importer of labor. <laughs> While about more than 4,000, almost 5,000 residents live and work in Boyle County, an additional 9,400 come in from communities and counties outside the county, while about 6,500 actually leave to go to work elsewhere. And how we see this breaking down is that the surrounding communities, particularly to the north, east, and west, are bringing in a large number of, a large portion of the labor force into Boyle County, particularly from Mercer, Girard, Lincoln, and Casey, but then a lot, there are a good number of commuters that are taking advantage of the quality of life in Boyle County and living in the county, but then commuting to areas in, to jobs in Lexington, Bay County, and the directions to the Northwest. So, and just before you move on, we're clear, the graphic on the left is where people who work here in the county live, and the graphic on the right is where people who live here in the county go and work. And you can see the, heavy influence of Lexington on people who live here but choose to work elsewhere, 
I was a little bit surprised personally to see the diversity of our draw for laborers here to the community, particularly the size of folks that are coming from the Northeast, which is up towards Lexington, and doing what you know us DC folks call the reverse commute, which is I'm gonna go against the traffic, but it's a testament to how Boyle County is an employment center within the region, and that you do play a very, very important role from that perspective, and something that frankly can be sold is our labor force is substantially larger than who we are. Um, you know, we talked a little bit about the, the size scale of that, but we also can make sure we can sell that. Even Lexington folks, not a ton, but even Lexington folks will come down here if we have the right job. So someone looked like they were about to ask. I was just going to ask about the scale of the, of the concentric circles. Uh, I know it's a little bit hard to tell. On the left side, it's 500 is the first dash circle, 1,500, and then 2,500. In oh, terms it's the number of people. Yes. Okay. yes. yes. Not, not how many miles. That would be, that would be very impressive. <laughs> do, we know, do we know if we're having people leave for higher payer jobs and having people come for lower paying jobs? We, we, there's no information that allows us to make that direct correlation. Um, I can tell you anecdotally when we've done research is pay scale in Fayette County is generally higher than pay scale is here. So I think that's a reasonable assumption. We just don't have any facts that can prove that. All right, so reviewing Boyle <coughs> County and the surrounding region's economy, we're seeing that the region overall has recovered from the recession, but that there are certain economic fundamentals that have changed. There has been, a gen particularly in Boyle County, we've seen that decline in labor force, but we've also seen the impact of changes and declines we've also seen the impact of global national and local factors that have really contributed to that labor force decline not just the recession itself before we move on to that i, I do want to call back those first three graphics in the section that we talked about which is the total size of our labor force the fact that we have returned to pre-recession employment levels and the fact that we're seeing a decline in our work aged populations. That's a triple whammy against large scale, and when I say large scale, I talk 250, 500 job companies coming to this area. We have 11,000 workers in the county, we have an unemployment rate around 6%, and our labor force has, has in the past steadily declined. People move for two primary reasons, to go to a job or where they're going to retire. The data is bearing out that people are really choosing here to retire, which is phenomenal from a quality of life and a cost of living perspective. However, the back end of that is then how do we then get people to stop leaving and get more people to come here from an economic development perspective? Because that's the other reason why people move somewhere. Well, uh, my question would be uh, the population size slightly increase. Our labor force is going down, but fact that we're more or less considered a retirement community and we're having old people coming in it's not working I would, <laughs> um, I would say it's probably more the latter we, we the, the popular I mean let's be frank we offer a small town quaint community feel and we have big town amenities that we can offer folks we have a very successful very vibrant very attractive downtown we have world-class entertainment through Center College and all the other venues that we have here in the community right. And comparative even to Lexington, we have a much lower cost of living. I'm a 30 minute car ride from whatever Lexington can offer in a very attractive, very um, um, amenable neighborhood, community. And so I think you're, you're seeing the effects of having all those wonderful things to make me want to be here as a retiree. But like I said, the other reason why people move somewhere is for work. And so if we are not in the game and being as aggressive as our neighbors, then we are going to struggle to bring those jobs, which is going to continue that, that loss of the labor force because those folks have to go find a job. And while they're willing to commute, I mean, if it's not somewhere locally, they're going to have to go to find it. Does that make sense? Have I answered your question? Okay, I, 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 I often talk and I don't realize if I ended where I meant to, so I always want to make sure that I'm clear. I'm concerned about the, uh, the number of people moving in. You're talking about people coming in. Yes. We're not getting the younger age moving in. We're getting Correct. the 
You're getting the 20 to 24 year old, which is a reflection of that center college's enrollment has gone up, and you're getting the 55 and older. Correct. Correct. Yeah. So are you, are, are you saying that if you focus on one area, you may pay a price in another area that you've got to, to understand that? Absolutely. I mean, from from a from a fiscal perspective, knowing that this community is 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 very cognizant of its fiscal arena, if you are bringing in lots of folks that desire services, whether they be entertainment, healthcare, what have you, and you're not also bringing in the businesses that help pay for those services, there is a long-term ramification to that, absolutely. So in terms of the existing labor force and what we've learned, we're seeing that education attainment really does, it does have the potential to be a benefit and an asset in attracting and recruiting new business because it reflects a wide range of potential employees and also presents an opportunity locally to, to look at opportunities for workforce development, both in specific training and certificate programs, so kind of the hard skills, as well as the soft skill development, which can start, as we talked about, as early as in elementary and middle school and progress throughout um, the your early education and then on into the other assets that are here like the technical college and, and I will say that I think we all are aware of all the issues surrounding the, the challenge that we have with people being employable not just being employed and while we support both from an economic development perspective and from a community perspective of how to address those issues one of the best ways an economic development strategy can help do that is to provide children a path of seeing why staying in education and staying on the, 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 the narrow road, there's a reward at the back end. And so part of that strategy, we believe, is an economic development one, which is how do we get to those kids before those challenges or those temptations become really prevalent so that they say, if I can avoid that stuff by 19, I could be making good money at one of these employers that we have here in the community. And so I just wanted to piggyback on Lauren's comment that, you know, we are not, we, we hear what everyone is saying and we're trying to find those solutions that are relevant from an economic point of view. And ultimately what we're seeing is that a proactive, proactive recruitment of additional businesses or expanding existing businesses to add more jobs is essential to economic development because as you add more jobs, you will also you will then attract more labor force and potentially maybe eventually convince some of the people who have been commuting to Lexington to actually live and work in Boyle County as well as other people choosing to move to Boyle County for that quality of life and because they have great opportunities to be employed here. And, and I will say we're going to get a lot more into this as we get into the process. But Lauren and I were very thoughtful about the term proactive by putting it up there on that slide. He's talking about how much and how aggressive are we at investing in that recruitment piece so that we can reverse some of those socioeconomic trends that we presented here tonight. We have a community college here that puts out What are you finding with those other communities? What do they do to, to provide uh, employees for factories or so on that, that maybe we're not doing? We're not, uh, we don't have enough space? Or what, what do you find that we need to do that well, increases to attract more people that are, are work ready? You know? Well, one of, the, one of the immediate issues we've already been made aware of is the challenges of your existing businesses to hire in certain aspects. And one of the reasons why we were, we were explained, and we frankly agree with this from our research, is why the community is pursuing these grants to expand the technical college is to produce more, is to turn out more quality labor. And that's just to meet the existing needs that we have, to be honest with you. Um, but to answer the second part of your, or, or really that was the second part, your first part of your question is, um, we talked about going down into the middle school and starting to create curriculum paths through your public school systems 
so that when they're 18, they're graduating, they maybe do a year of, of certification, and they're ready to take on those jobs <coughs> and be ready for that workforce. And so there's some communities are reaching down beyond just high school graduates or people who are already you know traditional working age and are trying to start cultivating that internally. Another way is to raise awareness through connecting not just potential workers but also parents of you know that younger generation to say here are the types of jobs we have in the community and these are the types of incomes that we have. It's like a, a showcase if you will of the business of the, of the companies that are here to say this is the type of job we have. This is the kind of money you can make by the time you're 21 years old. But here's the things that you have to do. Here's the, the requirements that we have for you to be able to qualify for that. It's, it's, so it's, 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 as I like to say, it, going deeper into your education system to start people a little bit younger to give them the alternative path to the traditional two or four year college degree, but then also raising awareness of the opportunities that are out there, but the requirements of those opportunities to be able to get the job. So those are, I'm not saying you're not doing any of that. I've seen communities that have more robust programs around that than, than what we've been able to uncover so far. So in addition to better understanding the, the current economy and Weld County's labor force, we also looked at real estate because that is an essential piece in providing space for the businesses that recruit and the ones that you are that are interested in expanding and investing in Boyle County. So overall, based on permit data as are back from 2006 to the present day, we're seeing that in general there hasn't been a, a large amount of development activity. The total has been about a little over half a million square feet and or about 600,000 square feet, and most of it has been concentrated in office and retail and a little bit in industrial. And this means that in general, we're just seeing a limited amount of development activity, which is reflective of the, of the real estate market overall. And, and, and just to, to, to clarify that a little bit, it's, it's relatively low, however, when you look at it, one of the things that we've learned is I'm not sure everyone in the community recognizes how much activity has been going on. And, and I will admit that, you know, now that I've had a chance to reflect on this information, is that's, you know, from a, from a Fairfax County, Virginia perspective, that's not a whole lot, but when we look at it on an overall scale, that's 60,000 square feet of commercial space a year that has been delivered or has been permitted here in your community. And that is a steady interest in development. And a lot of that is a testament to the efforts that have gone on, particularly around expansion. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. Also, speaking of, <laughs> <laughs> the fact is, recently there has also been a good amount of activity, even in the, about the last year or so. There are about 11 new projects and three expansions that were completed in 2015. Many of them were smaller projects of 5,000 square feet or less, but the new projects totaled approximately 80,000 square feet, which is actually higher than that, that kind of distributed average we just talked about of the recent permit information. But the key here is that there have been expansions, and we're actually seeing that projects that are in the pipeline also include about more than half of them are expansions. And this is great because this means that there are existing businesses that are interested in continuing to invest in Boyle County and expand within Boyle County. And, and if, like Lauren did mention, if you look up there, those industrial warehouse plant proposed projects are over a quarter million square feet of space. And when we look at your overall total square footage, that, that is a significant number. So we've been averaging and if you remember, 2006 and 2016, the first handful of years there, frankly, you probably lost a lot of businesses that you've got to backfill. We are now in a process of growth where we're seeing that that interest in coming back to the community is there. I will say, because that's a little bit confusing with your employment totals, is this goes back to the change in how companies are using space, particularly on the industrial warehouse side. With the use of technology and, the, frankly, the, the, the change in philosophy of how much labor will we want to put on the table, that more square feet still doesn't mean a net more jobs. And that's the, one of the challenges we face from an economic development perspective, and I think it's important to bring up is, 
we have a 100,000 square foot building that today may employ 100 people. If that company relocates and we backfill it, it's highly likely not going to be 100 people that move back in. And so this goes back to, I made the point, I'm going to keep ha harping on this throughout the process, what type of role are we going to take if one of the goals is total job count? We have to recognize the fact that we're going to have to increase our efforts just to stay at our level. Just, and that's a, that has nothing to do with Boyle County. That has nothing to do with your current economic development efforts. That's just the reality of the world in which we live to be able to have that level of sustainability. You're talking largely, as I hear it, on manufacturing space and manufacturing jobs. And what about the other sectors of medical and educational and, and other sorts of... Well, I, I would argue that the, the, the 11 up there are probably more concentrated in retail and office. I don't okay. know the specific numbers on that. Um, I will say that the, the ones that remain on the, on the books are, are more geared towards the, the, the manufacturing warehouse side of things. Um, but this goes back to, and I, I appreciate the question from the standpoint from an economic development perspective, is where are we going to invest our time? Where do we have the greatest opportunity for success? And frankly, what do we want to look like 15 years from now? Because while we may, and you, I think you actually made the point, Ron, is it may be something that wants to come here, but is that something we want to come here? Does that, I mean, yeah. is, is going back to that? I, I don't, from my personal perspective, I think there's room for everybody here in Boyle County, but there is a limited amount of public resources we can invest in trying to make that happen, and where do we, where do we put that? So we've talked about the impact and the, the positive part of the expansion of existing buildings, especially new projects. The other piece here is that this activity does reflect, though it has been steady to a certain extent, reflects a recovery of the market overall since the recession. And that's something that we've also got some initial feedback from brokers on, is that the commercial real estate market, market has really started to return to its pre-recession level, which is positive. But our analysis of the, the existing inventory and the fact that there has been some inventory added, but there's much more inventory that already exists, is that there's a lack of new space. And it does limit the, op the opportunities for businesses because there are certain businesses that really do need a very modern space with specific capacity, height restraint, height requirements or bay requirements, things like that, that the existing inventory of property does not necessarily have. And so ultimately that has the potential to limit the variety of marketing or the types of businesses that you can market to because, because there will be a need for us to focus on those that are tailored towards the current inventory. And, and I, I will add one thing is one of the things that we learned today that didn't get a chance to make it in the presentation is the perception in the community of whether expansion is viewed as successful economic development. Is we don't see a new building go up. I mean, someone made the mention to me is if we don't see a new building go up a lot of time it doesn't get credited as successful economic development. And I think that's one of the education processes of this evening is if I have a 50,000 square foot building and tomorrow I make it 75, that's just as good as someone coming in and putting in a 25,000 square foot building. And I think we as a community need to start recognizing that is as much a success from an economic development perspective is as, as the new prospect. And I, I will say, research shows, and I, I, would, I would challenge anyone to show me proof otherwise, expansion of an existing business usually is a lot less expensive from a incentive perspective than bringing somebody in new. And so there's, there is value to that, but I think this is one of those times where defining economic development and understanding the effects of it, I think the community needs to become more aware of the different faces that that success looks like. In all those numbers you're putting together about square footage and so forth, <coughs> expansions, building on, anywhere in there is there uh, figures to uh, show how many businesses are sitting empty right now? Just because of the new buildings going on doesn't mean it's all that great because right now we're losing as many and we got and on the bypass for instance a prime example probably 10 buildings with 100,000 square feet or more they're sitting in so does 
this market you're looking at, does that take any consideration of that? Uh, the, the, when we look at the various market segments, office, industrial, retail, we did look at vacancy. Um, I have to tell you, Lauren, maybe you know better than I do, but I, I don't remember in the data that we have a million square feet of vacancy here in Boyle County. Am I, am I wrong about that? It, it's something that I think we need to look into. That, see, that feels like a lot for the community, but let's say it's, it's, it's true, for example, that goes back to that goes back to the fact that recruitment into an existing building also is something that isn't always considered successful economic development. And if I have a vacant building and I get someone to move into it, you know, it's it, it's almost like well, you're just replacing jobs that you lost, and and that is that's not how economic development works. But the reality is, and and this is a conversation, frankly, we've had with a lot of people is. There's a line between creating your own competition, which then you're undermining your own success but then also having the right supply available so that prospects who have different needs have the opportunity to locate here. And one of the things that on our task through this process is to ensure that we help you ride that line properly. Is because if I need 30 foot ceiling heights, for example, if with my business, there aren't a whole lot of choices here because most of your vacant buildings are not that tall because they're that much older. And so I can't rip the roof off of one of our buildings and build it up. And so that's an opportunity that we would have to lose because there's just no way, to, you, can't, it's, you can't always shoehorn someone into an existing space, I guess is my point. So we've, we've done that, a little bit more of an overview of the current commercial non-residential market. Um, so now we're gonna look at actually some of the individual markets um, and we're gonna start with office. So as a comparison, to Boyle County and the more local real estate market, we took a look at the Lexington metro area market for, because they are the closest large competitor and they are an attractive, an attractive area for businesses based on the fact that they do have that larger labor force and have a great amount of connectivity with the potential to be steps from interstate access. So, as we're seeing in the Lexington market, they're experiencing an overall increase in the office vacancy rate. And what this means is that there is a large amount of supply on the market that is actually exceeding the existing demand for office space in Lexington. Metro area. I'm sorry, the Lexington metro area. Not yes, not just Lexington. And the res as a result, we've also seen an increase, an overall increase in the asking rents in the Lexington metro area. And where this can have an impact is when comparing those, yes? Lauren, can you go back? Mm -hmm. That, on the left, you've got the value, the cost. Mm -hmm. What size are we talking about? What square footage or what it, 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 it varies greatly. The, the metrics that they do for market analysis is what the average space cost is, and you're gonna see in just a moment, Lauren's about to talk about. So it's not per square foot, which is the way I use it. That is per it square is. foot, per but, but that's the average for the overall metro area. Okay. To, to, to your question, it okay. can range greatly depending upon location, size, condition, okay. age, all those factors play into it. But in general, and I think we all can agree that when Lexington office, use, office owners drop their rates by $2, that has a profound effect on us. Because all things being equal, if that levels to what we're asking, it's going to be a very tall challenge to compete with that. And so looking at this is our way of saying, okay, how are they doing? And that could be a help, help benchmark, well, how are we doing and are we competitive within that world? Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. So looking at the local office inventory in Boyle County, as Kyle just mentioned, the condition and the location really does impact the price, per, the least price, per, the least rate per square foot and the price per square foot. For purchasing. For purchasing. And so the, that difference can be that we're, we're seeing higher, uh, higher lease rates for listings in downtown Danville and for specific use spaces like office space. Medical office space. Medical yeah. office space. But the range in Boyle County is about $10 a square foot to $22 a square foot. But in the surrounding communities, the typical lease rate of, of I should say, Lebanon, 
um, Stanford and um, Harrodsburg, um, the rates are similar but a little bit lower overall, 10 to $15 a square foot. And this reflects that in some cases, Boyle County is offering, um, offering office space that is in particularly good condition or has been renovated prior to it going on the market. And so similar to those lease rates, there's, we're seeing a wide range of listings for in office properties for sale from $83 a square foot to $104 a square foot. And this again is impacted by the condition of the property and by its location. But overall, as we saw in the previous slide, with lease rates in Lexington of over almost $17 a square foot, when compared to the office inventory in Boyle County, Boyle County is generally speaking a value option when compared to Lexington. And it has the potential to be very attractive to smaller, non-location dependent businesses, a little bit like us, where we can work in a number of places and are and can prioritize things like quality of life, which Danville, which is a big asset in Danville, um, to attracting tenants. And, and I will say, once again, how do we tie this information back to an economic development plan? If we're going to try and attract office market users, from our perspective, your greatest potential success are those types of businesses, professional service firms, architects, engineers, economic development consultants, uh, that I don't have to be anywhere because my clients are everywhere. And we offer a quality of life venue, very similar to say like in Asheville, North Carolina, or Charleston, South Carolina, where there's a particular lifestyle that we can offer to people that would be very attractive. And when you look at us against the big city, which is, you know, Lexington proper, our success is going to be in that value option. That's wonderful for our existing space. One of the challenges from a new construction perspective is, will those lease rates support the ability to put in a new building? And from our perspective is, the owner-occupant is a much more likely than trying to spec an office building and then try and find leases for it. And that can be very, very challenging. And, and, and you'll hear that's a common theme is that if we're going to try and do renter occupant is going to require a more proactive effort so that we can bridge the gap between cost and income. So overall, what we're seeing in the office market is that current listings, though, are limited. They're there are not a lot of existing limited, and they are very diverse, which can potentially be a benefit because there's a lot of individual space available at a, at a range of different sizes and different price rates and different conditions and different locations. But when it comes to attracting businesses, there are not a lot of options within each price range, within each type, within each condition that can appeal to a broad range of businesses. And as Kyle mentioned, we are seeing that there is a preference that price points really are impacted by the potential renter or buyer preference on where they want to locate and whether they're willing to put a little bit of sweat equity in after they've started renting to fix up the place. So there, there is a component of, of personal investment that makes no business sense for Boyle County when it comes to particularly office space. There's a piece of it that it doesn't necessarily have to make financial sense because it's where I want to live or it's where I want to my office to be or I really need to be close to the hospital, for example. Is saying there's a piece of it that, or I want to do a live work or I want to live in the, in the space above and have my business downstairs that supersedes sometimes the, the logic that a true arm's length transaction would be. And that's a good thing from a standpoint of if we have the right, pace, the right space in the right location, we can transcend market. However, going back to Lauren's point, the fact that there's not a lot of it in any given particular market or size or condition, it can be very, very challenging from a recruitment standpoint. So now we'll move into the industrial market. 
So the Lexington metro area, this industrial market, has generally seen a decline in vacancy rates since 2011 as the demand for this space has increased. And there has been a little bit of a blip there, as I'm sure you can see, in manufacturing. And this is because of the fact that the landmark, Lex I'm sorry, Lexmark uh, property, they, they just closed. And so that in, in recent months, and so that has really impacted the 2016 numbers, though that may change if they get a new tenant into that space for next year. And, and I think that we here in Boyle County can appreciate the impact that one single user can have on the um, equilibrium within the market. Um, is that that's a, a single user of about 200 or so thousand square feet that grows vacancy up to 20% for manufacturing space. This to me is an indication of a the benefit of diversification, the size of our businesses that are here, but also some of the some of the challenges that we face when we look at it saying, well, we lost one business. Well, that was 20% of our occupancy. And so we have to look at it with those measured lenses, if you will, to understand the impact when you're a, rel a smaller market, particularly when you <coughs> had much larger, you're going to have much bigger economic swings as a result of an individual decision. And so, from our perspective, this goes back to that diversification and frankly supports the idea of if we focus on the small mid-sized company, one person leaving will not have as profound effect on our community as a Lexmark has on, had on Lexington. So in the Lexington market, the current, the typical lease is about four to eight dollars a square foot for industrial space. And there, and recent built to suit development, development has led to facilities that are priced between $35 and $50 a square foot. So that when that's compared to Boyle County, the typical lease rates in Boyle County are about a dollar to $3 a square foot based on current listings, and the sales prices are $20 to $25 a square foot. And this goes a little bit back to the point we made earlier about the office market, and that is that Boyle County has an opportunity to potentially be that value location for businesses that are not as reliant, that do not need to be located in Lexington, but might be attracted to being in Boyle County because it's a little bit less expensive in terms of their rent or in buying their property, and they again get to take advantage of that great quality of life. And, and for anyone who makes their living in building buildings, you know that $25 a square foot does not cover the cost of a newly constructed manufacturing building. The reality is, is that you can't, you're likely not going to get out of your facility what you have to put into it to make it work. And for an owner occupant, that's not a big deal because that's rolled into their cost of doing business. When you're trying to bring a business that is not interested in owning a piece of land, then it becomes how do we then gap the bridge between what it costs to be here and what we can generate in revenue to make that a, a decision that makes sense. When you compound that with the, how aggressive some of our competitors and neighbors are in reducing those costs even further, it goes back to this is, building new buildings isn't always a sound financial investment. And this is why the public-private partnership for economic development has become so popular and frankly so successful is that's the number, the, best way and easiest way to bridge that gap is as a community we're making an investment to bring that activity, bring the jobs, bring the revenues, knowing that we're putting a little skin in the game. This is a complete sea change from the success that Boyle County had in the 70s and 80s, where the market was willing to pay market rate for those buildings. And as a result, it was easier for it to be all private sector investment. It, this is not to say that an owner occupant won't come to the community by any stretch of the imagination. It's saying that if we want to be on the same plane as the competitors that are the, the, the dozens in the local market area and the thousands throughout the country that are going after that same opportunity, we may have to change how we think about that type of investment. So in doing the research to better understand the it current in, uh, inventory of industrial property, what we found was that there, there really are a limited number of listings. And most of these listings are at, at least 140,000 square feet. They're large buildings. 
um, primarily with tenants that have been recently vacated, um, space that's currently available. And so when that's compared a little bit to the surrounding communities that we mentioned, their prices are, are range as well, but they are reflecting the fact that there is an, a factor that goes towards that economic investment as well as the location that has led to such a wide range of available industrial space in surrounding communities. And, and frankly also the age. Newer, more modern facilities that have the amenities that businesses look for, they tend to be willing to pay more than a building that there's gonna require a lot of retrofit or doesn't necessarily meet all of their needs. Just like new construction and residential tends to be more valuable than a resale house, it's, it's, it's a similar kind of concept. So overall, I, we've actually covered most of this, yep. so I'm not gonna go through it all, but the big point here is that the recent demand patterns um, indicate that the market is strongest for a small to mid-sized project. In fact, a lot of the prospects that are looking at the county are looking for space between 500,000 and, I'm sorry, between 50,000 and 100,000 square feet, more on the smaller side, and frankly, not necessarily the size of some of the properties that are currently on the market. Um, by comparison, there are some other properties that are out there in the communities that might be currently meeting that need, but there is the potential for Boyle County to really create this as a niche. There are a lot, a lot of larger properties in the surrounding communities as well, and so this is an opportunity for Boyle County to really focus in on what it can offer a business that's looking to locate outside of Lexington and take advantage of the quality of life. So another area, because we mentioned it earlier, I know there was a question about are we going to talk about retail and office. We talked about office, now we're going to talk about retail. So the Lexington market in retail has seen overall a slight increase in vacancy. Um, over time and over the last few years and as a result we're also seeing a similar increase in the price per square foot the average price per square foot for uh, retail property in Lexington this means that overall there's been likely a decrease in demand as well as an increase in supply yeah, the, the other factor is folks are snapping up the cheapest space and so when the cheaper space comes off the market because they're trying to reduce their overall operating costs, that leaves the more expensive stuff on the market. And so it's, the connection is it's not necessarily that people are asking for it because vacancy is going up, is people are taking the space that are least expensive because that's where they feel they're going to be most competitive from a revenue expenditure perspective. So understanding that Lexington Metro perspective, we then wanted to better understand exactly what amount of retail is supportable in the markets in and around Boyle County. Or in Boyle County, I'm sorry. Well, let's, and, let's take a half step back yeah. here. Is we look at retail sales capture of the businesses that are here in the community. And we look at the expenditures of people who consume here in the community and understand where sales are leaking, meaning we're spending a million dollars on shoes, but businesses are only capturing half a million dollars in shoe sales, so that $500,000 is now being spent outside of our market. So the first step is understanding where is there that leakage happening. Then we take that and translate back to, okay, how much additional retail act activity could be supported by the half a million dollars? Because, you know, in certain, for example, in uh, grocery stores, they tend to want between $500 and $700 a square foot in sales. Uh, more neighborhood scale retail, maybe be able to survive on $250 to $300 in sales. And so you have to take that leaking sales and figure out what does that mean in terms of how much additional retail you could support in our community. And so what we're looking at here is the culmination of that effort, understanding where there are opportunities to grow additional retail activity. I will say overall, when you look at Boyle County, we are a retail magnet. We support a market substantially bigger than our community. 
when you, in almost every retail category, and we don't want to bore you with all the numbers, but almost every retail category, we are capturing substantially more sales than Boyle County residents are spending on those goods. I don't believe that's a surprise to anybody, given our role in the, the regional market, uh, particularly when you go halfway between Lexington and here, and then further south and, and west. So, but the reality is, we're, well, that's a wonderful thing, that we, are in, we have more activity than, and frankly, a greater variety of retail than we generally would if we were just serving our population. It also creates a lot of challenge in growth, because if we're already capturing 170% of the sales that are occurring here in the community, there has to be a compelling reason why someone's going to drive to continue to spend more on that. And so, what you're looking at up here is the result of the analysis of our assessment of what of, of whatever leaking sales we have could we realistically bring back to our community? The two eggs that you see up there, and I, I apologize if it's a little bit challenging to see, is we looked at Boyle County as a whole, but then we also looked at the what I call the east side of the county, if you will, which is around Danville, and the west side of the county, which is looking at the Paraville area, because the reality is there are certain retailers that are locally focused that someone may not want to drive 10 miles to buy a good. And so we want to understand, well, is there a potential for additional particular retail growth in Paraville, which is like we know is a priority that they've established through our outreach efforts. And so I'm just giving the background on, this is what, what you're looking at here. Look, I don't understand why our community, you know, doesn't have, uh, and I'm gonna get after all more people in, we have a better quality or better variety of grocery stores. We have two grocery stores, right? Correct. The challenge there is, I mean, groceries in one particular, this is an easy answer for me. Grocers look at what your market is. They tend to want between 3,000 and 5,000 households. Most grocery stores say, we'll locate when there's 3,000 and 5,000 households. I believe you have, and I am speaking off the cuff, I believe there are more than two grocery stores per se. And we also have to remember, this place like Dollar General and uh, Dollar Tree sell dry goods which are grocery sales. It's not a traditional grocery store like you would think of, but they capture a, a bunch of those sales. When we looked at the data for the market, both the smaller markets, Danville and, and Peril, but then as a county as a whole, the reality is there isn't enough unmet demand to justify someone opening a new full grocery store. The average grocery store wants to be between 50 and 60,000 square feet. The larger ones can get up to 100,000 square feet. You have to have like I said earlier, let's say they want $500 a square foot in sales. At 50,000 square feet, that's whatever number that I can't do that math in my head off the top of my head. But the reality is we don't have enough of that unmet need and they're not gonna cannibalize themselves. They're not, uh, you know, let's say Kroger isn't going to open up another Kroger because they're just gonna be stealing sales from their own store. And so and in, in, in the industry that's called cannibalization, I'm, I'm stealing from one to the other. And even amongst competitors, particularly in the grocery store business, they're not willing to go below that threshold, even if they know they'd be stealing it from the other guy, because they still need their $500 or $600 a square foot for them to survive. You don't think this has an effect, though, on uh, involvement? If you're getting ready to move to that town, you say, well, they've only got two grocery stores, I've got to go to Lake and shop? No, no because retail right follows rooftops. The industry terminology is retail follows rooftops. You get more people to live here, more retailers will have interest in the community. We've been fortunate in attracting people 55 and older. As more of those folks come in, there will be additional retail demand. But I think that because we have grocery stores, and frankly, it's not very hard to get around Boyle County. I mean, I got from here to Perigold back in like 10, 12 minutes. So it's really not in <coughs> <where you're coughs> It's only speed if you're caught, right? It's only, it's only breaking a lot to get caught. But I mean, <laughs> to that point is, I mean, frankly, I travel 10 minutes to get to a grocery store and it's a mile from my house. And so the, it, it, is, it is relative. I can go 10 miles in 10 minutes here. I can go one mile in 10 minutes back home, but that's still not an, an insurmountable amount of time. So no, I don't think that someone looks at, at Boyle County and says, there's only two grocery stores here. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna move there. I think they're saying is, there's two grocery stores here, and they're close enough. And until you can show the grocer that there's a reason to open a third store, and we'll talk a little bit about that under hotel, that's not going to happen. And, and I'm stealing a lot of Lawrence Thunder here, but we didn't find evidence that there's enough market to make that happen. 
And we, we did see, though, that there is a small amount of supportable square footage that in the parable market that would support maybe more of a market style grocer that has some essentials, um, as well as possibly a small pharmacy in the health care, I'm sorry, in the health and social and personal care stores, as well as um, supportable square footage for restaurants. And as I believe we know, there's already a potential project in the line, uh, in the pipeline for that. You know what, Lauren, that's a, I think even better example is, we identify there's market for a full service restaurant, and someone in this market has already identified that and is in the process of trying to make that happen. Now, that was, substantially improved when they passed the uh, decision on whether or not to be able to sell alcohol. But the reality is that was a market need and, that, and it's going to be met. So from the Danville perspective, the, there's a potential to add um, a small amount of space for clothing stores as well as sporting goods or hobby musical instrument stores um, as well as book or pure, uh, periodical stores as well. And one thing to keep in mind really on, on both of these and in all of these categories is, as Kyle said, a large grocery store needs, what, almost 100,000 square feet? 50, 50, 50, 50, 50 or more. So that, that's a lot of space. And none of these numbers reach that size. So while Perigo might be able to support a market size at about a little under 5,000 square feet, the other thing to keep in mind here is that all of these categories have the potential to add product lines to existing businesses. It, it may be a matter of identifying, well, you know, there is a demand for clothing stores, but identifying what that demand really looks like and then encouraging existing businesses that, hey, there is a demand for this. Maybe you'll be a test case for it, and let's see where things go. Here's a perfect example. It was mentioned to us yesterday, the, the desire to see a men's clothier. The data is saying that that has potential, but not a men's warehouse. It might be an independent downtown men's warehouse <coughs> that could meet that need. How do you factor in uh, internet sales in, in this category? They factor themselves in. There's a category called non-store related sales. And so that's basically buying non-point sales. That's already removed from the process. I would also say in our, over the years of us doing that, the amount of sales per square foot requirement has changed because um, source point sales, sales in stores, that whole market has changed. And so when what a million dollars of sales in the past may have reflected 5,000 square feet of space, it's now less because they recognize that there's that competition. So the market, the data, our analysis kind of takes those things into account. So when we look at the space for potential new retail or expansion of existing retail. Similar to the office market, we're seeing that condition and location also impact lease prices. And there's a wide range of leases from those located along the bypass to those in downtown Danville. And feedback from local realtors indicates that the strongest demand right now is on the bypass between Perigold Road and Houstonville Road. And, and I think someone mentioned to me earlier today the fact that what about all that stuff east of Houstonville Road along the bypass? And while there are some infrastructure challenges there is people really want to be where the, the uh, traffic counts are, where the action is, if you will. And so there, you, you would say, well, that's not really that far away from Houstonville Road. But the reality is, to a retailer, it's miles away. And so when you look at it, as Lauren said, downtown has the attractiveness for the, the, the niche mom and pop destination-based retailer that doesn't need a ton of space. Pretty much that, that stretch along the bypass is the, the most attractive location for the more traditional chain and what we call credit tech, you know, the national retailers. And in terms of buying a retail space, we're seeing that that location and the condition is also having a big impact on uh, price per square foot there as well. And that ranges very dramatically, partially because there are a lot of different types of retail. You've got everything from shopping centers to the smaller downtown Danville, smaller square footage spaces for that mom and pop store. Um, the other interesting thing that we discovered during this process is that um, 
overall, there is there's a moderate amount of inventory in for retail, and but the reality is that inventory is very diverse, and that ultimately has the potential to impact where the supportable square footage is can be applied within the community today. And, and to put it in other words, just because the store is vacant today doesn't mean it's necessarily competitive in the market. And one of the things that we would encourage you from an economic development perspective is to look at maybe some of these assets and recognize that maybe they don't have a long-term future as that land use, and then how can they be repurposed? Because when you look at, and I would say 13,000 square feet is not a lot of square footage. If, if you know retail space, you have some very large vacancies. You can, you're going to, if you have more space than you frankly need, particularly on the bypass. And so then is, all right, how do we be strategic about using that space and what are some of the other potential opportunities that can go from an economic development perspective? Just because it's retail, it was retail once, doesn't mean it has to be retail in the future. So what our retail analysis did tell us is that the Perville submarket really is more focused on, on local retail, retail that's going to be convenient and most accessible to the people within that immediate submarket, and, and could really benefit from the potential of, the, of tourism growth in that area to add additional, additional demand for that small market or that restaurant in that location. And, and to jump down to the last bullet is, a lot of it also requires some substantial rehabilitation. The likelihood of putting new construction out there is probably very low, but there are some very cool historic buildings out there that can be repurposed. One of the challenges that we learned is there's a lot of cost in getting that up and running. And so they've been somewhat successful, and I'll give them a lot of credit in terms of using grant monies to help make that happen, but the reality is, for example, Merchants Row, it's going to be, it's going to take a very, very long time if you're constantly relying on grant to make that happen. And while I would argue downtown Danville is not near in that situation, the reality is it's in a very, very good situation comparatively, there's also could be some challenges, particularly in upper level space in downtown, of how do we reactivate it, whether it's retail or some other use. In fact, we were told um, some, when the upper level space is so unusable because it's not been invested, it's not even calculated the value of the building for sale. Is that they only calculate based on the ground floor because they realize the upper level effectively has no value. That's fine from sale and purchase price, that's terrible from an economic development perspective because you want all that space to be active. And so even though there is pot some potential demand for local and more county-wide retail in the Danville submarket, the, the fact that the existing inventory might actually meet that demand by the numbers, the condition and the status of that inventory may not actually um, be the most competitive. So we haven't actually talked about the hotel market yet. We've focused a lot on industrial and retail and office, but that is definitely another component in the non-residential market analysis. And what we've seen is that overall, Danville hotels have experienced an increase in occupancy rates since 2011, a notable increase, and have actually exceeded the point around, I believe it's 60% uh, 60 occupancy, where the market has such high demand that flags and other hotelers start to consider additional development. The rule of thumb in the industry, once I hit 65% occupancy, I start looking around. Once I hit 70% occupancy, I start buying. You're up at close to 75% occupancy, which if you were curious as to why the Holiday Express was under construction, they didn't need to look no further than that information. So as the occupancy levels have increased, what we're also seeing is that in general, this is a, a strong market for business travelers, as well as a lot of early fall activity, maybe a little bit of fall foliage, um, I think, and the reenactment, and a variety of other events that are really attracting people to Boyle uh, to Danville and Boyle County in October. So I will say, personally, I now, now, now know why you booked this meeting in December, because you at least had six more occupied room nights in your hotels. 
<laughs> so in addition to looking at occupancy, a lot of um, hotel developers will also look at the room rate, the change in roommates, and the revenue per room to look at the efficiency of how the rooms within a market are actually actually functioning. So overall, we're, the Danville market is seeing an increase in room rates, and they're also seeing an, an increase in revenue per, per room, meaning that in general, the efficiency and the demand and the market itself is growing in strength. But, and to put it in more layman's terms is they're raising their rates and people are consuming at a greater level. That, that also indicates a very strong healthy market. So when you combine this together, um, this indicates that the market can support, a, it has the potential to support additional rooms as witnessed by the new Holiday Inn Express that is nearing completion. And that actually may impact occupancy in the short term, but given the trends we're seeing thus far, there is still the potential for additional development that would be focused on more of a unique product or a unique hotel that won't be in direct connections with, or I'm sorry, in direct competition. <laughs> Or have a direct connection necessarily. There you go. With, with the nice holiday. Nice <laughs> Good recovery, Lord. Good recovery. <laughs> with the Holiday Inn Express or the Hampton Inn, um, other existing hotels, and this might look like a boutique hotel in downtown Danville um, that can add to the range of accommodation options within the county as well as taking advantage of the existing demand from Center College and the hospital that are located right there. And I will say, I will add based on some of the conversation we had this week, the, the success of bed and breakfast out in Perigold also has been notice, notable. It's ones and twos, not 50s and 80s, but the reality is there is a market out there as well that can be invested in from an economic development perspective. And this is where the, the, the merging of traditional economic development and our convention visitors bureau work can work well together. It's not just identifying the opportunities, but also working to make sure that they happen and also communicating with our existing hoteliers to alleviate any concerns that we're encouraging greater competitions in the market. So where do we go from here? We've <laughs> just given you a very, uh, though a broad, very comprehensive <laughs> view of the current conditions within the market um, in Boyle County and the surrounding communities. So our next steps are to start really focusing in on the target industries that have the potential um, to focus that business recruitment that we've talked about quite a bit during this presentation, as well as doing a more in-depth analysis of the existing real estate to identify potential um, locations that might fit within the market for where additional new inventory could be built and developed or redeveloped. And we're going to continue the process of doing stakeholder interviews and focus groups so that as we continue to collect this information, we will also continue to get a very on the ground, first hand experience of what's happening. Data is wonderful, but personal experience and first hand accounting is necessary for us to get the full picture of what's going on here in the community. And so, for those of you who've already sat down and spoke with, we thank you for your time. Um, however, understand that this is a long process that we're going through. We still have several months left in, in here. We're going to try and reach out to uh, substantially more folks that have a perspective, and hopefully different perspective, on economic development, what that means for the community. So the presentation tonight, and I appreciate the interaction, we're happy to address any additional questions that you have related to what we have up here, or our next steps. Hopefully this has helped establish a, a, a baseline, if you will. When we start talking about, well, we think this is better for the community than that, you'll have some of this information. I know they've been recording this, um, which is good, so you can always refer back to it, because I know you guys are gonna watch this at least five or six times. But we all have sleepless nights, and it's something that will put us to bed. Um, but also is the fact that, um, this information will be available, the presentation will be made available. We felt it very important you hear this firsthand. Not only be able to ask questions, but to understand, as I said, when we get to the back end and say, we think this should go here or there, or we think you should be doing this and not that, you are fully of, uh, aware of why. 
And so with that, we'll open it up to any additional questions. And if not, then, then we will adjourn. I do want to say very quickly, we apparently talk so much, we need two <laughs> sign language people because their hands get too tired. So we'll work on that for next time. We apologize. Thank you for being here. Terrific presentation. An hour and a half right on the money. Pretty good. You're free to go. <coughs> I'm not ready. I'm just going to go. Yeah, I know. You're free to go. <laughs> <laughs> You've been so, so with that, are there any additional questions from, from, our, from our front tables here about what you've heard? Can I ask, is there anything in here that was a surprise or new to you that maybe you weren't aware of in the past? I think to some extent, to me, it was uh, kind of a, something new that we were looking for smaller companies, I think, or smaller square foot buildings. And while I was aware that some of our neighboring communities might have been building and giving away spec buildings, I wasn't sure what size they were building. Prevalent that is in terms of our competition, but apparently it's, it's a trend. Sadly, uh, I equate it to professional athletic teams, and you see the free for all, or maybe maybe something a little bit closer to home in Kentucky, the approach to go after automotive manufacturers, and the obscene amount of incentives that are thrown at them. It translates all the way down to the small twenty-five thousand square foot user. Well, we have today's gallon. We have known for some time, I think, that we have a limited or almost a non-availability of buildings, small manufacturing building space. We've got some large ones, but not for small ones. That's interesting. Um, how comfortable or confident are you on the concept of a boutique hotel for downtown? from the available demand and the location compared to where some of that demand is being driven, we're very comfortable with it. I think that there is a tremendous market opportunity for that to happen. The challenge is the building, because you need to have an appropriate size building, you need to have a building that is either, either a piece of land where you can build a building, or if the, if the X factor is how much is it gonna to cost to turn that existing building into a hotel? Because while I think the market is there, from a demand side and the revenue side, it all depends upon, if I'm building new, I think it's a lot easier, frankly, than some of the rehab that may have to go on, particularly, as I mentioned earlier, those upper level uh, stories. Because they may not have been invested in, in decades. <clears throat> yes, sir. Do we, do we have an ordinance on how high you can go, how many floors you can go and sit? Yeah, somewhere we Six, six, six floors is six, a six floors. Floors. The, uh, it used to be the reach of the fire truck at one time. Well, and, and I also say the boutique hotel, we're talking 20 to 50 rooms. We're not talking a traditional, you know, limited service business class hotel like the Holiday Express, for example. We're talking something that maybe is a little bit more upscale. We're talking something that's much smaller. Hopefully we'll be able to offer a unique experience like a, a you know, a, a very nice, restaurant as part of the opportunity or frankly even a spa, you know, the day spa. There are opportunities, you know, a lot of hotels are diversifying in that regard to attract other types of opportunities here in the market. But this is one where I'll leave it to the hotelier to decide what they think the other amenities that should go in there. This is not meant to be prescriptive, but more identifying opportunities. I'd like to know one thing that maybe Henry asked a question about the empty building. What what would be suggested that we could do with this? You're saying that people don't want them in a want a you know, like a home. Well what, what's the idea with what can we do with uh, the bypass which we got four or five people that we've been into for quite some time. Well I I mean and this goes back to establishing the priorities of our community. It's not that no one wants them. It's that they're not going to be as competitive in the market and you're going to be challenged with what potentially the owner wants as rent or a sale price and what the occupant is willing to pay. And so one option is we cover the gap. As a community, we come together and say, we want you here bad enough that we'll subsidize, for lack of a better word, to get you here. The other thing is you be patient and you recognize that it may take a while for that to be occupied because expectations may not be realistic to the market and you continue to market, you continue to advertise and try and attract users for that building. The third option is 
tear down, rebuild. Now that also depends upon the owner. They may not want to do that. They may not have no interest in that. And so that may not be on the table, but there is also the potential that there may be a higher and better use for that location to be used for some you other type of development. earlier about location. It seems like it. Location east of the bypass, or east of Polk Street, seems like it's never done as well as west of, of Polk Street. I would agree with that. Because traffic counts, because access, transportation, visibility, all those things have impacted where development went. I, if I'm driving an 18-wheeler, we built 2168 to try and get tractor trailers out of downtown, if I, if I have the story correct. They don't have to go downtown if they're out on the bypass. The reality is also when the initial industrial parks were placed, there probably wasn't a whole lot out there at that time. I'm, gonna, I'm taking a flyer. I don't think I'm quite old enough <laughs> to, have, to have been around for that to happen, but it's also a reflection of that's where the community at the time decided that they wanted that kind of activity to go on, which helped perpetuate some of the activity that went on out there. The uh, switch back to hotels, downtown hotel, what price range would you would you guess would fly here? Uh, I would say for a downtown boutique hotel, you could probably get at upwards of $150 a night. I, I'm, in full disclosure, we're playing something pretty close to that to be at the Hampton Inn or at the Comfort Suites our at night when we're in town. Our Airbnbs go for $220. Yeah. Our, our Airbnbs go, oh. one of them is, goes for about $220 at peak time. So I think you could comfortably do 175 Yeah. I agree. One observation I heard repeatedly through opening your presentation to our entire quality, term quality of life, mm -hmm. as being key to our strategy that we might develop to try and go at every sorts of businesses we're building. You know, development activity strategy is real seed. And so it would seem that we will have to continue to have a focus on maintaining or increasing our quality of life as a core value to, to maintain the success in the economic development. Absolutely. I think that one of the competitive advantages we have over some of our neighbors, and that's reflected, like, for example, in office and retail with these rates in downtown, is the quality of environment that we've made through the investments through Heart of Danville and through other downtown investments, and frankly, how the private sector, the college, the hospital, have then made subsequent investments behind that gives us a competitive advantage. I can have a little downtown Lexington experience without all the craziness. And so there's a lot of value to that. And so balancing economic development with quality of life is critical. And that's why we need to be strategic in the investments that we make so that it's not just done for the sake of doing it, if that makes sense. Yes. We, we lost uh, a homegrown business here about oh, five, six, seven, five, six years ago, uh, which, and, and it, was a, it was a very nice, 50 to 75 person business uh, and the reason w was that uh, the young people, they couldn't get young people <coughs> uh, because there's nothing for them to do on the weekends. So the business wound up moving to Lexington to accommodate and to be able to attract uh, MBAs, PhDs, uh, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. so, now that's been five, six years ago, and a lot's changed. But is it enough change to attract young people? I think this is a testament to, for that particular type of business, maybe 50 to 75 is a stretch for a community of our size. Maybe we're at 15 to 20, and we can hit those. So this goes back to scale. I think that depending upon the type of business that you are, there's opportunity. <coughs> And do I think that what we have here is attractive to young people? Absolutely, I do. And that's really my question. Yeah, I think, I think we are competitive into it. It goes back to what is realistic from a standpoint. I mean, there are, there are limits to, to what you can draw on the amount of time a business needs to have those people in place to be able to make it, to make it work. If I need 100 astrophysicists that might be a tall order for a community like this, where Huntsville, Alabama probably can deliver that in space. So it's also a competitive market, is, you know, am I gonna locate in Fort County or am I gonna go where that, that action is already taking place? And if 
I'm Boyle County, I want those types of jobs, what am I going to put on the table to make that happen? Could you get 50 to 75 people of those types of jobs to move here? Yeah, but you may have to get involved as a community to make it worth their while at that scale in that amount of time. Does that make sense? Yeah, when you say get involved, that's code four. Become a active participant in the attraction and retention of those folks from a policy, regulatory, and financial perspective. That's <laughs> love. <laughs> You've been in D.C. too long. Exactly right. There's, that, there's my beltway answer. There you go. No, it's, it's, it's how competitive are we going to be from a incentive perspective to make it worth a lot. There it is. Yeah. So I want to thank everybody so much for being here. All of you know that we are accessible to you. I would would request that you make that recommendation through the EDP, but we'll be happy to continue this conversation, email, phone, and if I absolutely have to see you again in person. But thank you so much, everybody. Thank you.